we'll keep an eye on it. Voluntary assisted dying here in Australia is either the law of the land in every state or it's about to become so. These laws are thoroughly the preserve of state parliaments, but there's one complication that hangs over in federal law. This has to do with doctors providing care or advice over the internet or the phone. It's banned at present. Now, West Australian Independent MP Kate Cheney has a private member's bill to try to tidy up this anachronism. She joined us earlier along with Dr Cameron McLaren, an oncologist and president of Voluntary Assisted Dying. Kate Cheney, Cameron McLaren, welcome both uh, to join us discussing what I think is a, a very sensitive issue, but not one that most Australians would be acutely aware of. We've got this small anomaly now that all states have voluntary assisted dying laws where providing medical advice over the internet or a phone is criminal in federal law. Kate, to you, first of all, why is a change needed for that? So, as you said, VAD is now law in all states, voluntary assisted dying, uh, and telehealth is a really normalised part of our medical system. But there's this provision that, that says that if you use telehealth for voluntary assisted dying services, then you are technically inciting suicide, so that's in, in breach of the law. Now, this means that people are not getting access to end-of-life services or we're making them travel long distances when they are terminally ill and suffering and in pain. Um, and it just doesn't provide equitable access to these VAD services for everyone in the country. Cameron McLaren, you're also president of Voluntary Assisted Dying. As a practising oncologist, have you ever knowingly broken the law via this means? Well, it's very hard to say, Greg, because I mean, sometimes we call patients and we ask them to come in for an appointment. I mean, is that transmitting material over a carriage service that pertains to inciting suicide? I mean, potentially. So it's very difficult to know what actually is in breach of this law. Tell us about the condition of the patients typically concerned here, the ones that you're communicating with, the ones that Kate is arguing on behalf of. Are they uh, very much in the terminal phase of a terminal illness? Yeah, there is a big, a broad spectrum of the patients who apply for this. There are patients who are now beginning to apply earlier in their disease process and thankfully even some that are too early who aren't, don't qualify on their prognosis just yet and we're able to organise things in a timely way. But I always say to people that um, many patients don't know that they have six months left to live until they have six weeks left to live. And then they're in a situation where they're suddenly scrambling trying to organise their not only their voluntary assisted dying application, if that's part of their, their wishes, but also things like their will, their advanced care plan, palliative care involvement. So it's, it's quite tumultuous for them. And so we often have patients who have left this quite late and, and it's very hard to organise in a suitable time frame for them. And Kate Cheney, I suppose it's logical, but is this more pronounced as a problem for those at geographical disadvantage, that is, those who would live in really remote parts of this country? I mean, certainly in my state of Western Australia, we have these vast distances to, to deal with. And so if you're living in a remote or regional area, um, it's pretty hard to, to get to a specialist in person. Um, but it does also affect people in, uh, in capital cities as well who cannot physically travel because they are um, suffering and, and they're in pain. Uh, now, there are lots of archaic laws in the statute books and I think not all of them are enforced. Is there any danger in, in highlighting this, having had it tested in the federal court, which happened last year, that it's practically uh, making life worse in a situation where it otherwise may not have triggered great attention? Well, my understanding is that a lot of medical practitioners are changing the, the way they deliver these services because of the risk of, of this law. So whether or not it's prosecuted is actually less relevant than the fact that there is fear from practitioners that they may be in breach of this. So that's why we need to address it. And Cameron, again, just to give us the benefit of your practical experience, what is the nature of the service that is provided or discussed in some of these consultations electronically? Well, were they occurring at present uh, that are currently illegal? Also, I guess anything is... Any information that I transmit to a patient could be in breach of this, of this law, including telling them that they're eligible. So it's, it would be possible to have a conversation with someone over a carrier service where they just tell me all about 
why they want to apply for this, um, convince me that they're not under any coercion, um, and establish the capacity that we need to assess their eligibility against the, the state-based eligibility criteria. But if I were then to say, OK, well, you meet all of the eligibility criteria, that is actually transmitting material that is uh, potentially could be construed as inciting suicide, mm. or informing them about the process or the medication or what the next step is in the process. So it's actually stopping us from providing good medical care, which is making patients fully informed of the process that they're about to engage in. What would be the response to the argument that says, by their very nature, decisions on death are intensely personal, and of all the circumstances that you might apply, telehealth, you know, valid in so many circumstances, this isn't one. This should, because of its intimate and personal nature, involve only a face-to-face -face consultation, only with a doctor that knows you and your medical history. Could it be an appropriate filter that this law actually, as it currently stands, requires, necessitates face-to-face -face consultations? I think it's very important to see the difference between a professional standard and law. So in other areas or sensitive areas of medicine, such as counselling termination of pregnancies or any other aspect of sensitive care that we have with patients, there is no legislation preventing telehealth um, interactions with patients or their families. Mm. This is something that we would have a professional um, stance against, is to say wherever possible, voluntary assisted dying assessments should happen face to face. Where that is not possible, the use of telehealth is permitted and should not, and this should not create a barrier for patients to access this. This is, keep, this is putting it back in line with what we already do for crisis counselling, for any consent procedure, for any surgeries. There's no legislation preventing any of that happening on telehealth except for this one specific area of medicine. Right, which makes it a real anomaly. And you've explained to us, Kate, the justification for it is that it shouldn't promote suicide. Uh, what is there, the risk? Is there any risk in removing it that it might lead to a concomitant rise in suicide? So my private member's bill doesn't repeal the section that says that you can't use a carriage service to promote suicide. It just says that voluntary assisted dying uh, in accordance with the state framework doesn't constitute suicide. Um, all the checks and balances and the strict conditions will still be in place. And it seems to me that if, there are, if we want to make rules about what telehealth can and can't be used for, the appropriate place for that is under practice standards, not under the criminal law. All right. Well, if nothing else, you're being here today and advocating and moving a private member's bill raises public awareness and generates discussion with Government. So I think you say most state attorneys general are on board. Uh, do you understand the disposition of the federal government? So um, this has been raised at multiple meetings of the attorneys general of all the states and, and federal. And a number of attorneys general have said to me that they would really like to see this issue resolved so that practitioners are protected and also people have equal access. Mm. Um, I've raised it with the Federal Attorney General. Um, he's aware of the problem and he said he'd consider the bill. So I'm hoping that government will, will see that this is an equity issue and um, it's something that could be passed quickly and, and simply. Well, you certainly raised awareness, uh, both of you. We thank you for finding a little time on a busy day here in Parliament House. Cameron McLaren, Kate Cheney, great to have you on Afternoon Briefing. Thank you, thank Greg. You.